Hello again. Uh, we are starting a new unit today, a new historical era in music history, and that is the classical period. And as I usually do, I'm just going to start off with um, a discussion of what that word means, classic or classical, and uh, also talk about the dates of this era, which are 1750 to 1820, if you go by what our textbook says. And most textbooks have something like that, although uh, you might find some textbooks that say 1750 to 1825, or maybe 1830. Um, we know the significance of 1750 uh, from our previous unit on the Baroque era. 1750 happens to be the year that J.S. Bach died. But in talking about that date earlier, I said that it's really kind of misleading because what we now call the classical style was already emerging as early as the 1730s, 1730s, the 1740s. Uh, in fact, I made the point that when J.S. Bach died in 1750, he would have been considered kind of an old-fashioned composer. And, in fact, two of his sons, uh, he had 20 children, uh, he had many sons who were important musicians, but two of them in particular, uh, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, known as C.P.E. Bach, and Johann Christian Bach, J.C. Bach, um, were uh, two of the leading composers of the classical style, and they were composing in this style uh, while their father, the old Bach, was still alive. So Bach's sons represented sort of the new avant-garde uh, composer, and Bach himself uh, represented a style that was already uh, becoming considered old-fashioned. So 1750 isn't really a good date, uh, and we keep that date probably just out of respect to J.S. Bach, and because it lies conveniently right there in the middle of the 18th century. But that's the date that we'll go with. If there's a test, in, a, a test question on the dates of the classical era, it's something going to be 1750. How about the other end, 1820 or 1825 or 1830, depending on which textbook you read? Again, there's nothing that we can point to, really, um, in the way that we could, remember, we could point to the invention of opera as a significant musical thing uh, that, is, uh, th that we can use to delineate between, let's say, the Renaissance and the Baroque. Um, but there isn't really anything either as we move into the classical era or as we move out of it. It's, it's a, a gradual transition and we really can't point to any one thing, and therefore it doesn't necessarily make sense to use any one year. Uh, even if we use the year of Beethoven's death, um, 1827. First of all, it's an inconvenient year. It doesn't end in a five or in a zero. Um, but also, uh, it doesn't, because Beethoven died, that's not something that caused the style to change. Uh, so, um, now, there definitely was a change in the first third, let's say, of the 19th century, a change into a style which we call now the Romantic style, but it, but it happened so gradually, um, again, we kind of just have to pick a year somewhat arbitrarily, and 1820 works as well as any other in that, in, in, uh, let's say, a decade, uh, one side or the other. So, 1750 to 1820, no real significance to the dates. It took me a long time to explain that, that there isn't really all that much significance. Um, how about the word classical? Well, this is, a, this is a word which, unlike the word Baroque, this is a word that we actually use sometimes in everyday conversation when we say something is a classic. Um, and uh, normally, if we were having our in-person class, our usual class, I would ask the class, this would be a class participation moment, I would ask uh, my class, okay, well, what does that word mean to you? And we would kind of um, explore that word a little bit, and usually what, what ends up happening is that we kind of agree that, um, first of all, the word classic, if something is a classic, that means it's good. It means it's good. Uh, which is interesting because, remember, the original meaning of the word Baroque 
was not intended to be comp complementary. Uh, the word Baroque originally meant distorted, exaggerated, somewhat grotesque, like a misshapen pearl. Um, but calling something a classic is definitely uh, complementary. Okay? Um, and it, it implies something else. Not, it implies that something is of quality, that, it is, that it's, its value is lasting. And how do we know that its value is lasting? Because it's old. This is another implication of the word classic. Something that is an oldie but a goodie. And, in fact, those two are mutually reinforcing because the reason that we know something is good, if it's a classic, the reason we know it's a classic is because it's good, and the reason we know it's good is because we still think it's good. It has stood the test of time, to use a classic cliché. Um, something which is a classic uh, sort of stands above changes in fashion. Um, trends, fashions, fads come and go, but that which is a classic always looks good. And sometimes I will, uh, also in my class, I will use the example, in fact, I'll, I'll ask the class, and, and you could try this right now. Think, if you're especially, uh, for, for women, think of the one thing in your wardrobe, in your closet right now, which could be called a classic that will never go out of style, that looks good in many different situations. You could wear this thing that I'm thinking of to, let's say, a party, or you could wear it um, to a concert. You could wear it in a slightly more casual uh, situation. You could wear it to, uh, in a business situation even, let's say, or, and, it, and it looks good no matter what. Uh, the thing that I'm thinking of is the little black dress. The little black dress is a classic item that all women must have in their wardrobe. Uh, and what is it that makes it a classic? You think about it. Well, one of the things is that it is simple, right? Um, you can describe it in three words. It's little, it's black, and it's a dress. Uh, and and this is a, it's what I'm getting at now are some of the, uh, the characteristics of the classical style. Uh, the little black dress doesn't usually have like frilly, poofy things on it, or a lot of sequins, or a lot of ornament, a lot of decoration, right? Because if it did, that's the kind of thing that goes out of style sometimes, right? Um, so simplicity, we might say, is a classical virtue, right? Now, before I get too far into some other uh, classical virtues or classical characteristics, um, I, wanna, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about that word and why it is potentially confusing. Uh, so, first of all, in, in the very beginning of the semester, I mentioned that, that this course was going to be about classical music, but that's a problematic term. And sometimes we, uh, we use the, the word Western art music instead of classical music. And this is one of the reasons that it's, that, I, that it's confusing, potentially, is that within the world of classical music, which we could say goes all the way from Gregorian chant um, to film scores that were composed yesterday, and it's a very, very broad uh, area within music. Um, but the problem is that within that, which we call classical music, uh, there's an era, which we call the classical era. Uh, so, depending on which meaning of classical you use, for example, J.S. Bach is not a classical composer. Johannes Brahms is not a classical composer in that sense. Bach is a Baroque composer, and Brahms would be a Romantic composer. But they composed classical music. Right? So this is one of, the, one of the things that we just kind of have to be on the lookout for with that word classic. Um, another uh, implication of that term classic is that we, we generally associate that term, when we talk about, for example, the classical civilizations, what we are talking about in that case is uh, ancient Greece and Rome, and when we talk about the classical world. So to a general historian, like not a, a music person necessarily, but let's say to a historian, or to a professor of classics, I'm not sure if if many of you have heard that, uh, that use of the word as a subject, 
you can go to a university, at least you used to be able to, and I don't think this is offered uh, at as many universities as it used to, but classics is an area of study. And what it is, is uh, the history, literature, and languages of ancient Greece and Rome. So you, if you were a classics major, you would study Latin, you would study Greek, and you'd study the history and the culture and the literature uh, and, and maybe also the art of that period. So that's another um, thing to be uh, mindful of. Now, uh, as it turns out, there, there are connections between the art and the architecture and the literature of this period of time, let's say 1750, 1820, or even a little bit before, um, and the art and literature and architecture of ancient Greece and Rome. There isn't much of a connection in the musical world, however, because, uh, as we've already learned, um, very, very few examples of ancient Greek music have survived to the modern era. And my understanding is that there are pretty much zero examples of Roman music. And when you think about it, it's kind of incredible. You have this this empire, the Roman Empire, which lasted for so long, and yet we don't have any music from that period. Uh, we know that they had music, they enjoyed music, but we don't have any written down music that has survived to the present day, which we could decipher. Um, and for that reason, unlike, let's say, classical architects or classical, uh, or let's say, <laughs> unlike uh, 18th century um, artists or architects or writers who had examples that they could follow, that had, they had models they could work from, uh, if they wanted to imitate that style of the Greeks and Romans, musicians didn't have that. Right? However, there are some principles that we associate with the classical style of the Greeks and Romans, which could be kind of extrapolated um, or drawn from. I mean, in other words, it, it might not be a, a, a direct musical example that you could imitate the way that, for example, in the neoclassical style of architecture. Um, you know, you look at, look at the buildings in Washington, D.C., for example. They are deliberately modeled on the styles of Greek or Roman uh, temples. You know, you've got those, uh, those columns, that facade with the column and pediment, and that look that we, you know, think of the, the, uh, the, the Lincoln Memorial, for example. It's, it's designed to make you think of a Greek temple. Right? And that's sort of a philosophical statement. It's not just, uh, it's not an accident that, that those buildings, let's say, look like that. Uh, there's, a, there's sort of a deliberate intent. It's sort of a, an affirmation of uh, your, your sort of philosophical outlook in a way. So um, there are principles that could be sort of gleaned or extracted from the classical style uh, and applied to music, but we don't have, you know, sort of direct imitation that you might find in the other arts. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk some more about this, these uh, principles of, of the classical style in the arts, but first I want to get a little bit into the historical background stuff. Um, again, I'm, I'm sort of trying to uh, create a big picture for you, and this big picture has a frame, and the frame is 1750 to 1820, and the title of this picture is The Classical Era, right? So now I'm kind of filling in the, the stuff in the background of the picture, what's going on historically, what's going on in society, so that we can understand a bit better the music that emerges, that, that is, let's say, going to be in the foreground of our picture, since this is, after all, a music course. And all of this stuff is covered pretty well in the Camian book. Again, if you have a ninth brief edition, if you start at around, oh, 155 or so, and I think I assigned reading up to page 165, and mostly this uh, reading deals with uh, the various meanings of the word classical and what that means, let's say, in the arts, as a style in the arts, but also what's going on historically during this period. And it is important to, to understand what's going on 
during this time, not just for this class, but because it turns out that this is a period which, first of all, we see tremendous change. Okay? Um, revolution, for example, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, we see it's a period of tremendous upheaval and change in many, many different areas of life um, throughout Europe and, of course, the Americas. But um, even more so, I think it's important to understand this era because, not just for this class, not just for uh, uh, academic reasons, but because I think most of us in the modern world walk around every day with, with assumptions, with ideas, with notions in our head that are a direct outgrowth of these times. That, uh, in other words, we are all creatures of or products of the Enlightenment. Uh, what is the Enlightenment? Well, the Enlightenment is the, the term that I would give, or that not just me, but, but that historians give to, let's say, the 18th century generally. In fact, sometimes you see it uh, referred to as the 18th century Enlightenment. So, in the same way that, for example, the Baroque era in music or in the arts existed within a historical era, a broader historical era, which we might call the Age of Absolutism, the Classical era exists mostly within a period that we call the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment itself is a, it's a vast, complex, historical sort of movement or phenomenon or period that um, I can't possibly do justice in, in uh, a half-hour lecture or you know you couldn't even really do it justice in an entire course. It's uh, um, it's so complex and has so many different aspects. In fact, just to speak of the Enlightenment is a little bit simplistic because there are really different strands, different varieties of Enlightenment going on that are often very contradictory to each other. So, for example, we have a sort of a French Enlightenment which leads to the French Revolution, but then we also have sort of a, an Anglo-Scottish Enlightenment which came to some very different conclusions and, in fact, was very opposed in many ways to the direction that, let's say, the French Enlightenment ended up moving in. So, it's a big, complex, and fascinating um, topic, the Enlightenment, but I'm going to try and uh, give you as, uh, as digestible a, <laughs> a chunk of it as I can in the time that I have. So, Right away, it's sort of like the word renaissance. You know that renaissance means rebirth, and that implies that something must have died in order to be reborn, right? We talked about that in the, when, we, when we were in the renaissance. Well, the term enlightenment implies that we must have been in the dark. And then, I guess, somewhere beginning in the 18th century, the 1700s, we began to see the light. Okay, well, um, yes. Okay, who, who is we? Well, this is a this is a phenomenon that's taking place in Europe, and and um, um, again, we often associate with the French, in particular, several French philosophers like Voltaire and Diderot. Um, but um, put simply, I, I think probably someone like Voltaire, whose name probably more than anyone else is associated with the Enlightenment would say something like, yes, we have been in the dark. We've been in the dark for uh, ages, generations, centuries. Who's, uh, who's been keeping us in the dark? Well, that would be the ruling classes and, before that, the church, right? Because, uh, you know, think about, think about the, um, the, the structure of society that I've talked about. Remember, the vast majority of people certainly through the Middle Ages, through the Renaissance, through the Age of Absolutism, and still uh, into, let's say, the, the Enlightenment, the vast majority of people have very little say over their own lives. Right? They are ruled over by, in previous centuries, maybe the Church, but the Church became less powerful, as we know, as we move into the Renaissance, and the nobility became more powerful, the aristocracy. Right? 
especially in this this era immediately preceding, right? The, the age of absolutism, when you have absolute monarchs like Louis XIV. Um, so uh, we've been kept, we, meaning the, the vast majority of people, have been kept powerless and often ignorant, so in the dark, meaning um, sort of imprisoned in a sense. Um, and, and so there's, there's an element of class resentment um, of let's and this appeals to the middle class. Now, I've, I've talked about the middle class uh, before, and I said that well, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the middle class is really a very thin. What we call the middle class, what we think of the middle class, a very thin, small segment of society. Let's say people who have to work for a living but are not farmers, are not peasants. You know, let's say skilled tradesmen, merchants, bureaucrats, or whatever. Well, this class of people, remember, I've said has been growing, it's been getting better educated, and as it gets uh, larger, and as it gets more prosperous, uh, this middle class is very receptive to these ideas, these notions that, you know, uh, why should I be ruled over by a king? Anyway, you know, why, or why should, why should a whole class of people, the nobility, have a different legal status than me? Shouldn't we all be equal, right? This is an enlightenment idea that we all, I, I think all of, all of us modern people, I like to think anyway, certainly in America, we walk around with this idea that all men and women, hopefully, <laughs> are created equal and that we should have equal rights, that we should be equal before the law, right? That we should have freedom of speech. The idea of freedom of speech, definitely an Enlightenment idea. We might take it for granted today. Or it's, well, it's obvious that you should, you should have freedom of speech. Uh, at least I, I would hope that we uh, believe that. Oh, there are some people now, I think, there's, <laughs> sadly, um, not to get too far off into a political tangent, but I think there are people today who maybe are not so enamored of freedom of speech as I am. But... Uh, let's say freedom of the press, or or let's say separation of church and state. That's a ve that's a relatively recent concept. Um, uh, th these are radical things. Now if you might you might hear me talking about these things and think, oh yeah, the things that we find in let's say the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Exactly. This country that we live in, the notions that form this country. The ideas that are in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution are definitely products of the Enlightenment. And at the time, they were, they were fairly radical ideas, right? They're ideas that are now, you know, 200-something years old that uh, I think many of us sort of take for granted. But, and, and this is what I mean when I say that it's important to know about these things even if you're not taking a class, even if you're not going to college or whatever. Because it's important to know where your own ideas come from. And it's important, I think, not to take them for granted, to know what the alternatives might be. Um, anyway, um, the Enlightenment, it, it's, it's hard to even to pick a place to start talking about it. Because, it, again, it's so big and complex. But we associate the Enlightenment with the, the 18th century, that is the 1700s, with certain philosophers uh, like, for example, Voltaire or with, uh, let's say, Immanuel Kant, uh, many others, who, um, it's hard to generalize about, but we might say, for one thing, that the Enlightenment prized rationality, logic, reason, over things like tradition, or superstition, or religiosity, right? For example, and this is how this, this idea might tie in with the political stuff I was talking about earlier. If you are a successful middle class uh, person in the uh, 18th century, and um, you are prosperous, you're well educated, you think you're, you know, you, your life is pretty good, probably much better than uh, your great grandfather's was, perhaps, and yet you still don't have any real political clout. Um, you might think, well, it's really pretty irrational, this, this monarchy that we have, right? Let's say in France. So someone gets to be a king, 
just because their father was a king and their father before them, even if they, if they turn out to be a lousy king, well, that's just the way we've always done it. That's tradition. And also, by the way, we have this, this notion of the divine right of kings. What is it that makes a king a king after all? Well, God has ordained him to be king. It's God's will that Louis is king and that you are whatever you are, that you are a shoemaker or you're a bureaucrat or whatever you are. It's all God's, God's will, right? So someone who is a, a more enlightenment frame of mind would say, well, that's just irrational and silly and illogical. And it's exactly this kind of thinking that has kept us in the dark, that has kept the vast majority of people uh, essentially powerless and ignorant uh, for so long. And what we need to do is become enlightened. Right? So, um, the enlightenment is the time that prizes rationality reason. And, and the book starts off, actually, in, in a good way, talking about this. Where does this, this uh, let's say, relatively sudden interest in being logical and reasonable and rational, as opposed to being, let's say, religious or superstitious or bound to tradition? Well, a lot of it comes from the scientific progress that has been happening um, all th really since the Renaissance, but especially during the 17th century, there's, there's just an exponential increase in, in scientific advancement in the 17th century, that is the 1600s. Think about, for example, I mentioned maybe just the two most famous scientific figures during that time, Galileo and Newton. But there's an awful lot of other uh, scientific advancement that's going on. And um, what we see is that what, what we call perhaps the scientific method, although there really isn't one scientific method per se, there are various methods, um, but what they, what they generally involve is, first of all, a lot of observation, close observation, taking measurements, taking notes, right, uh, running experiments, and, and starting from a position also of skepticism, that is, not believing uh, that something is true just because it says so in some textbook, or not believing, for example, that everything Aristotle said was essentially correct, and if Aristotle said it, it must be, and this is basically how the universities taught for, for an awful long time. Um, a lot of these experimental scientists, most of them during the 17th century, were not university professors the way that scientists tend to be today. The universities were mostly just kind of preserving the works of, let's say, Aristotle and a few others, and just kind of assuming that they were true and teaching them. Uh, but it turns out that Aristotle, although uh, a genius, was wrong about a lot of things because he didn't employ uh, these methods consistently, and he didn't, he didn't have the tools very often uh, to have done so even if he wanted to. But in the 17th century, scientists are making tremendous advances. And these advances are based on uh, m close measurement or sort of reasonable, rational principles. Logic, measurement, a lot of math, and not assuming anything right, to be true, but really verifying. And these discoveries are improving people's lives. So particularly, let's say, in the field of medicine, but also in, in let's say, engineering. Um, people's lives are actually being lengthened and improved because of these scientific advances. And what happens is that um, as progress is made in the sciences, and it trickles down and into uh, society at large and improves people's lives, the leading thinkers, or let's say philosophers of the day, many of whom were scientists, in fact that term philosopher is a little bit misleading. Today we think of a philosopher as someone who is thinking very abstract, lofty thoughts, but um, in those days, uh, philosophers and scientists were much sort of closer together. In fact, a, a, what we call a scientist would have been called a, would have been a natural philosopher, a philosopher who was interested in nature. Anyway, um, the philosophers of the day, many of whom were scientists, came to the conclusion, look, look at all the progress that we've made by being rational and logical, the progress that we made in the sciences. 
imagine if we apply this kind of thinking and methodology not just to understanding nature, understanding the universe, but to everything. For example, in establishing a system of government, what if we try to come up with the most logical, rational system of government rather than the one uh, that we've just always done because that's tradition and it's God's will or whatever, right? So this is what I mean when I'm talking about the, the principles of the scientific method, which had gotten such tremendous results and continue to get such results uh, in the 17th century, being applied more generally to the human situation in the 18th century. So the Enlightenment uh, is, is a very optimistic kind of movement. It assumes that things can be made better, that progress is possible, um, and it was a time of extremely rapid progress. Um, it kind of cracks me up sometimes when I when I see sometimes people, in let's say condemning or criticizing, um, say the Bill of Rights, um, and they say things like, "Well, in those you know certainly Thomas Jefferson or, or, or Madison or whoever couldn't possibly have imagined X, Y, or Z. Like, oh, they couldn't have imagined." Uh, airplanes or the internet or whatever, and, and I always I always think, well, why is this? Do you actually know anything about this period of time? Because this was a time of extremely rapid progress, and I think if you could go back to those times and ask, let's say, Thomas Jefferson, do you think in 200 years we will have flying machines? He would say, well, I, I, at least I think he'd probably say, yeah. In fact, I would be surprised if it took that long. Given the rate of progress that we've seen, anything is possible. So it's a time of, ex of extremely rapid uh, change, both, let's say, technological progress, but also societal change, societal upheaval, and it's, it's often uh, not pretty also. This is a time, maybe one way to think of, the, uh, of this period of time from, let's say, roughly the mid-18th century up to the early mid-19th century, that is, let's say, roughly from 1750 all the way up to maybe 1850. Going now, if we're talking about that time span, we're going past the classical era. But it's sort of like um, you know the way the way that we think of the 1960s, let's, especially here in the United States. When you think of the 60s, you think of a tumultuous period. You think of the Vietnam War, the civil rights struggle. Um, you, you think of let's say maybe the assassinations of. Uh, John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. You think of, you, you might think of the, the sort of the clash of generations, let's say, between the, the, the generation that had fought and won World War II, who had hair like this, and their children, the hippies, uh, who are taking drugs and rolling around in the mud in Woodstock and have long hair. Okay, so th there's... Um, this is the kind of uh, this is the kind of thing that went on uh, during this period of time, except that only being instead of being only a decade, it's like a hundred year period of intense upheaval, war, revolution, but also uh, tremendous technological prog progress, scientific progress, and um, it, again, it makes it difficult to 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 teach or to talk about to even pick one place as a starting point. Um, anyway, to, uh, to tie it in with the book a little bit, the book talks about this, this historical phenomenon and in tandem also talks about uh, the art. So I'm going to try and kind of narrow it down a little bit from the general historical background to the arts, and then from there we'll move even more narrowly into music. So they give some examples of, of how, let's say, in contrast to the, to the style of the Baroque period, excellent example, uh, two examples actually, over here on page 158. All right, so one is this painting of the death of Socrates, um, which uh, I'm not going to hold up to the camera. You can 
Uh, you can, it's a very, very famous painting by uh, the French painter Jacques Louis David. Um, and uh, first of all, just f f leaving aside the subject matter for a moment, if you look at the figures, um, I mean, first of all, I guess I shouldn't leave aside the subject matter. Think of this, the choice of subject matter. Uh, ancient Greece, all right? So that's sort of a, a statement of affinity. And choosing Socrates um, as a subject, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But just look at the figures. Notice how most of these figures are posed. They are in sort of stable, static poses, rather than as we saw in the Baroque era, I remember the thing that was characteristic of Baroque painting or Baroque sculpture was that figures would tend to be in these sort of very contorted or twisted. They're, they're sort of in the middle of doing something. It's sort of like a snapshot of someone in action, giving me a, the illusion of motion, of dynamism. We don't find that as much in the uh, classical style. In fact, um, this painting in particular maybe makes you think sort of more of the, the Renaissance style, right? And think of the Renaissance itself. Well, what was being reborn? Well, the attitudes and the, the ideals of the ancient Greeks and Romans. So in some ways, the uh, we can think of the Enlightenment as being sort of like a reverberation, an echo of the previous uh, Renaissance, um, or an outgrowth of it. Okay, so... Um, Look again at this painting of the death of Socrates and, and uh, try and recall what was it that Socrates died of? What, why was his death so significant? Um, he, he, of course, drank hemlock. He was condemned to death uh, by an Athenian court. He was convicted of uh, corrupting the youth of Athens. Uh, and how did he corrupt the youth of Athens? Well... What did Socrates do? He was basically just a teacher, uh, and he had a group of sort of like, you can almost think of them as disciples, a group of, of young men who, uh, they would just hang around Socrates, and they would sit down somewhere in the public square and have a discussion, and Socrates felt like, you know, any topic was open for discussion, um, and you may be familiar with, for example, the Socratic method of, let's say, a teaching by asking a question posing a question as a, as, a, uh, as a way of exploring people's assumptions and attitudes, and, and Socrates would kind of poke holes in your assumptions, right? And this is the way that he taught. Well, the authorities or the, the, the powers that be in Athens didn't like this. They sort of felt threatened. Uh, their authority was threatened by people questioning uh, certain assumptions, or um, and, and so this is why some of them found... Uh, Socrates to be a threat, right? And this is why ultimately he was uh, taken to court and prosecuted and sentenced to death. Um, and apparently Socrates, you know, didn't really mind so much being sentenced to death, and he willingly drank this hemlock. You know, this is he was allowed the relatively dignified uh, method of death, which is to to drink this poison. Um, and maybe some of you are familiar with this very famous, perhaps apocryphal quote by Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. And here he, he's kind of putting, uh, putting his money where his mouth is. You know, if I, cannot, if I cannot question, examine, think about, speak about whatever I want, then I might as well take the hemlock, right? So anyway... Socrates is, is drinking the hemlock, and notice he's continuing to teach. He's, he's got his students around him, and they're all in various poses of woe and grief. But Socrates is, doesn't see, notice he doesn't even look at the cup. He's looking instead at his students, and he's making some kind of a point, you know, and he's got his finger pointing, um, kind of disregarding, like, oh yeah, I've got to drink this hemlock, you know. Uh, and the hemlock, by the way, no, notice also the structure of this painting. The hemlock is in the exact center of the painting as it's being handed from, uh, you know, to, to Socrates. Socrates himself is literally enlightened in this painting. He's bathed in light. Notice uh, the background is very dark. 
and that makes Socrates stand out even more. So he is literally and figuratively enlightened. Notice also his pose. So he's got the one arm kind of upstretched like this, the other arm reaching for the hemlock, and he's bathed in light. What is this pose perhaps meant to remind you of? Well, it's probably meant to, be, to deliberately remind you of, let's say, older religious art where Christ is on the cross in much the same pose. I think Jacques-Louis David is making a point that, that Socrates is sort of like, um, is the heroic figure for us, um, us rational people, us enlightened people, in the, in the same way that Jesus was for, let's say, a, a previous age, except that Socrates is not dying for your soul. He's dying for your, maybe for your mind, you know, or for your freedom to think and speak uh, as, you, as you wish. So, um, a similarly heroic martyr kind of figure, but a martyr for uh, the mind, the intellect, uh, rather than for the soul. Okay, the other uh, color plate that's on this page, page 158, is of Thomas Jefferson's house, which he designed himself in Monticello. And this is an example of what I talked about. And notice it, it looks kind of similar to the White House. For you. It looks similar to a lot of buildings, uh, let's say in Washington, D.C., or government buildings, or sometimes you see banks that have this kind of appearance with this classical portico with the columns. And um, For Thomas Jefferson, this is more than just, oh, this is kind of a stylish house. It's a statement of his affinity for the classical civilizations. It's sort of like he's staking his claim and saying, yep, this is, this is me. This is who I am. Um, it, it's, he's a fan of, uh, of those values. Um, now, while we're on the subject of, of Jefferson, obviously a controversial figure today um, because of the fact that he owned slaves, and thus we can, uh, I think, uh, we can point to him as being kind of a hypocrite. You know, if you really believe that all men are created equal, why are you owning slaves? And, and actually, Jefferson himself was against slavery. He thought it was a, um, he, he thought it was a, a bad thing, and yet he still owned slaves. It's a very complex question that I'm not really going to get into, but um, I, I will leave, uh, I will say, however, though, that although Jefferson may be a hypocrite, at least a hypocrite knows what's right, let's say, and uh, unfortunately doesn't act on it. Um, but a lot of people just thought that slavery was the natural way of things. The Romans, the Greeks that had slaves, uh, slavery was more the rule than the exception in human history up to that point. So it's kind of, it's very easy for us today to point the figure at Jefferson and say, aha, hypocrite. Uh, but he was, in most uh, regards, far more enlightened than uh, his contemporaries. Um, and so, certainly he wasn't perfect, um, but um, it's a little bit neither here nor there. The point is that this is an example of what we might call a neoclassical style in architecture, which is happening right around the same time as the what we call the classical style in music. In the case of architecture, there are again there are models we could draw from. We could we could look at a Greek at the ruins of an actual Greek or Roman building and imitate that style. We don't have something similar in music, as I mentioned. Um, okay. So again, you should read all this stuff. I'm just trying to flesh it out a little bit. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to go over absolutely everything in the book. But the, histori the history of this period is important to know. Um, you can't really uh, understand the music nearly as well if you don't understand the historical era that produced it. Um, one thing I will, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on now, um, is how the role of the composer uh, undergoes a shift during this period. So, although there are many, many composers, uh, we are only going to study three. We're going to study the, th the three that are by far the greatest of this time period, and those are uh, Franz Joseph Haydn, the oldest of the three, 
uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and of course Ludwig van Beethoven. And so Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven in that order from oldest to youngest are the three who are kind of head and shoulders above the rest. Um, now, remember that in the Baroque era, the, uh, the role of the composer, and this was actually a question on our last test, the role of the composer was essentially that of a high-class servant, because most composers worked on the staff as, let's say, a court composer to some wealthy, powerful nobleman, uh, like a king or a duke or what have you. That was kind of like the best that you could hope for, actually. There were some musicians who were church musicians. J.S. Bach, for example, the last 27 years of his life was a music director at a Lutheran church. That was actually a position that had less prestige than, let's say, working for a duke or a count or a king. Um, now, as we move into the classical era, we're going to see a transition from that sort of model of career to that to a different model which is that of the freelance composer who is basically in business for himself in fact we can we can kind of plot this change uh, if we look at the careers of these three composers Haydn Mozart and Beethoven Haydn had who was the oldest of the three born 1732 happens to be the same year that uh, George Washington was born um, Haydn being born 1732, well, that would, that would mean he's sort of coming of age right around 1750, which is the, the problematic date for the beginning of the classical period. Well, Haydn had the kind of typical career that we might see of a Baroque composer. For most of his life, Haydn worked as music direct director for a very wealthy Hungarian noble family, the Esterhazy family. Uh, now, he worked for the Esterhazys for 30 years as court composer, court music director, providing music for this family. Uh, the, the, the Esterhazys had a number of different res residences, including an enormous palace out in the countryside, which had its own built-in concert hall and opera house. And Haydn was basically... Uh, a, a servant, and he was told what kind of music to, to create. You know, he had, he had assignments. Um, he couldn't just kind of do whatever he wanted. He had to compose music that was in the style that his boss preferred, and he had to compose the kinds of pieces that his boss wanted. So if his boss said, you know, I'd like to have an opera next month, then Haydn had to get to work on an opera. Now, Haydn was actually content to have, in fact, he felt himself pretty fortunate to have this kind of position. Um, and he, he did retire after about 30 years um, serving this family. And in his retirement, he had kind of a second career as a freelance composer. But he was only able to do that because he had put in his dues, uh, paid his dues, and put in his time for 30 years. Um, the next composer we would look at, Mozart, chronologically. Mozart uh, was born into a musical family. His father was a court musician, and Mozart served in the court of the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg and uh, played violin in the court orchestra. Uh, now, it, Mozart's career is a little different because, as you may know, he was a phenomenal child prodigy, and he was constantly on tour as kind of a boy wonder musical genius touring from one city to the next, pretty much continuously from about the time he was uh, in, in eight or nine until he was about 15, right? Um, and when he started to become a, a young man rather than a, a little kid, his father thought, well, the best thing for you is to have some kind of a position like, like what I have. Um, but Mozart kind of chafed at this for a number of reasons. Uh, he didn't like being treated as a servant. After all, he was treated as a superstar when he was a child. The people oohed and awed over him. But now that he was an adult, he had to settle for being merely another uh, member of the staff of some high and mighty prince. Uh, this kind of rubbed him the wrong way. And in that sense, uh, uh, he, he was, you know, being 
being a generation younger than Haydn, he's more, we might say, more a product of the Enlightenment in that he keenly felt this uh, kind of class division in a way that Haydn probably did not, that Haydn probably took it more for granted, like that's just the way the world is, what are you going to do? But Mozart is of a younger generation. Um, anyway, Mozart uh, finally had enough, uh, or maybe his boss, the Archbishop, had enough of Mozart, actually. They mutually, uh, there's a lot of dislike there. Mozart was actually fired by the Archbishop for insubordination. And he was physically kicked out of the Archbishop's presence, literally kicked out, uh, into the street. And uh, Mozart then decided, well, you know what, I didn't like working for that guy anyway. I'm going to set up shop for myself as an independent freelance composer. I'll compose my own music, I'll arrange my own concerts, I'll hire, let's say if I'm doing an orchestral concert, I'll hire the musicians myself and rehearse them, and I'll sell tickets, and... Um, so he became, he tried to establish himself as more or less freelance composer. And for various reasons, he was kind of unsuccessful at this, at least financially unsuccessful. Obviously, he was successful in that he composed some of the greatest music ever written. He was successful as a composer, but not as a businessman, really. Um, and there are many different reasons why this is the case, and we can talk about them a little bit later when we talk about Mozart more specifically. But... Um, I would say that Mozart attempted to forge a career for himself as a freelance composer, but was uh, largely unsuccessful, at least judging by the fact that when he died, he was deeply in debt. Um, and uh, so that was his situation. Beethoven, on the other hand, uh, is perhaps the first major composer to have never worked, at least as an adult, to have never worked as a court composer, never been anyone's employee. Beethoven was maybe the first successful freelance composer uh, from the time of his, really his, his early 20s, his, his uh, adulthood. He never had to work as anyone's employee. Now, he did receive money from the nobility but it wasn't with strings attached. Uh, it wasn't like, I want you to write this piece. It was more that, first of all, actually, the, the nobility in Vienna, we'll talk about Vienna in a little while as well. Uh, Vienna is the modern-day capital of Austria, but it's the city in Europe where all three of these composers lived and worked for at least some part of their career. In fact, Beethoven spent really his entire adult life in Vienna. And the nobility of Vienna... Um, actually paid Beethoven, uh, but didn't ask necessarily for anything in return. They just wanted to keep him in Vienna, and so they kind of pooled some money between themselves just to give him a stipend so he wouldn't be tempted to move someplace else because they admired his music so much. Uh, Beethoven was definitely a product of the Enlightenment. He had, um, he had these notions that we associate with the time of, for example, that the nobility really aren't any better than you and you and me. In fact, Beethoven, his attitude was, if anything, I'm better than them because I have talent. I have genius. If you're a prince, it's just because your father was a prince. But what I am, you know, I, 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 I can actually do something. I have, uh, I, I, have, I have genius. I can create something. I'm not, I am not what I am just because of who my father was. Um, so Beethoven was a successful freelance composer who never had to work as anyone's employee during his adult life. And when Beethoven died, he was pretty well off. And, uh, you know, tens of thousands came to his funeral, and he did not die penniless and in debt the way that Mozart did. So he was financially as well as artistically successful. So um, after Beethoven the idea of the court composer really kind of goes away. And, and the reason for this is that, first of all, the, the times are changing, and um, composers, creative people generally, of the newer generations, let's say of Mozart, who was born in 1756, or Beethoven, who was born in 1770, these younger generations don't like the idea of being someone's employee. 
as a creative person, as an artist. Now, they want to be free to do whatever they want and not have to please some nobleman who thinks he's better than they are. But also, the nobility itself, um, increasingly, is not interested in having their own private orchestra, uh, you know, in their own private composer to give private concerts on the grounds of their palace. It's really just unnecessary. First of all, it's expensive, right, to, to maintain an entire orchestra and a composer and all those musical instruments and to have your own, you know, opera house or your own concert hall. It's expensive and it's really just unnecessary because for that money, what you could do, if you're a music lover, let's say you're a wealthy nobleman and you're a music lover, what you could do is just buy a second house in the city and during the concert season, you could just go to concerts. In fact, you could probably have your own luxury box in the opera house. It's reserved just for you. You could have your own reserved seat. You could have season tickets and you could go to, go to public concerts. There's just no need anymore for these kind of private concerts. And also these kind of, these conspicuous displays of wealth, having tremendous huge palaces with hundreds of servants, that's the kind of thing that causes resentment. Uh, in fact, that's the kind of thing that maybe can uh, get you killed if we're talking about France uh, during the Revolution. So the nobility, depending on where you are in Europe, the nobility realize that, you know, they can feel this resentment in the air from the middle and lower classes, and many of them are wise enough not to want to make things worse. So they don't have, you know, conspicuous displays of bling as much as they used to. And they are downsizing. In fact, in, in many cases, let's say in France, um, the estates of these very, uh, of the nobility was basically abolished for a while, and the estates of the, of the nobility were confiscated. So the situation is different depending on where you are in Europe. But, but everywhere, there was, uh, there was this feeling of tension between the classes, the different classes of people. Uh, and remember, of course, Europe has been, and to some extent kind of continues to be, much more class conscious than the United States. Uh, again, the United States, is this country, is a product of the Enlightenment. And ideally, I think, uh, we don't think of ourselves in this country as being upper class or lower class. Everybody tends to think of themselves as middle class. You know, probably something like 80% of people identify as middle class. And we don't really have a notion of a lower class or an upper class, maybe a working class and middle class. And, uh, but we are a much less class conscious society. And so it's maybe harder for us to understand uh, being here in America and being 200 something years removed from uh, the events that the book is talking about. Okay, so uh, I think I'll wrap it up here. This lecture has probably already gone on a bit too long. Uh, next time I will talk a bit more specifically about musical things rather than historical things, and so we'll see you then.